bom. Eu fiquei super é, feliz de ter conhecido é, o lugar do, do Copenhagen Suburbitals. É, dá para ver que é algo bem simples, é basicamente dois hangares, né? Aquele ali, onde é uma espécie de escritório e armazenagem de, de material, de, de oficina. E o hangar, que é o que a gente teve, que é um pouco maior. Que é onde eles desenvolvem os protótipos de espaçonaves. Mas dá para notar que é uma, é, uma, é, uma, é uma região aqui de Copenhague que tem diferentes hangares, cada um deles, os bem maiores, bem grandões mesmo, olha aquele lá enorme. É, esses hangares, cada um é para uma coisa, se você comparar com a, dif a diferença do deles, que olha o tamanho para aquele lá, realmente é, é uma proporção muito diferente, eles têm essa pegada bem amador mesmo, é verdade. É, é... É uma dor, é pequeno, mas é... mas é interessante, é potente. O Peter me pareceu ser um sonhador, não foi à toa que eu comparei ele um pouco com o Von Braun, mas ele deixou bem claro as diferenças políticas dele com o Von Braun. Um... Well, he means something to me. Uh, he means uh, inspiration. And he is a complicated uh, person to deal with because... He started out working uh, for the German uh, for the German military in the 1930s and 1940s, and we can be happy to say that he spent a lot of their money making pretty useless rockets that that, that didn't make any difference for the German war effort, but that certainly uh, made a huge difference for the development difference for the development of space flight. Uh, but he certainly did work with the Nazis in doing so and has some level of guilt connected to the people, to the slave workers who were put to, into the production of the V-2 rockets. And that, that's why we cannot just think of him as a hero. He's a complicated person. He's a complex person containing both good and bad. That being said, uh, he's always been a sort of inspiration. And some time ago, we fired the first rocket engine here using his favorite rocket propellant, which was liquid oxygen and ethyl alcohol, the stuff that he used for the V2 rocket. And it, uh, that engine worked just perfectly. And my first thought was to go to his portrait in the hangar and say something like, uh, thank you very much, Herr Professor. Your recipe still works. And uh, th there was a special moment because, uh, hey, uh, whenever we do things according to the to the tradition that he pioneered, making rockets with liquid propellants, making rockets with turbine pumps, and and using the principles, the technical principles, principles that he engineered, uh, and his team engineered, we have success. And whenever we try something else, we have limited success. So it's quite, it's quite interesting. But uh, here we open up the door to um, hangar two. If I can find out like this. Right now it's dark in here, but I'm going to turn on the light. You come inside. Uh, the one project is the spacecraft and the other project is the booster, or rather, all of the mechanics that is required to take the spacecraft into space. And we have um, divided the project between Christian von Bengtsen and myself, so that he is managing the development of the spacecraft and all of its systems, including navigation, recovery, spacesuit, survival at sea, all of those things. That's Christian's department. My department is the development of the booster, the launch pad, all of the stuff that brings the spacecraft into space. And this is the way we've divided it. If we go over here, we can see a one-tenth scale model of our future spacecraft. Um, it was used for um, experiments in a wind tunnel to verify the aerodynamics 
properties of the uh, of the spacecraft. And then he has had a larger model built. Over here, we have one of the two soft sides on the third scale models. See the same geometry. This is used for another experiment, but it's also to verify the aerodynamic uh, stability of the capsule during uh, two different phases of the flight. And finally, over here, we have a full scale model, which is being used to find out about how to set up the interior of the spacecraft. It has two sections. This is the bottom section. You can see it's the same geometry as over there, and the top section is standing over here. So Christian is, is really building uh, the spacecraft. He's designing the spacecraft in a process involving different sizes, and he's very systematic in doing so. Uh, finally, after this boilerplate has been flown and experimented with, he's going to build a version the ultimate version in aluminium, in light metals, and uh, it's going to be equipped with the heat shield and everything, and the full system, all the electronics for a manned flight. And it's, again, step by step. You don't just jump into it and say, hey, let's build the final spacecraft, day one. This is really the, uh, the challenge of things, is that you have to take it step by step. This is my section of it, the propulsion department, where we built the, the rockets. This is uh, the one we're looking at here, this silver bird, is a, a rocket booster called the HEAT 2X2 because this is the second rocket of 65 centimeter diameter that we have ever built. We launched one of this size uh, in 2011 and now we have refined the design, the design immeasurably and we have switched to the von Braun propellant <laughs> using alcohol and liquid oxygen as propellants. This aluminium uh, rocket is more powerful than anything we have ever, ever flown and it's actually the most powerful amateur built rocket in the history of amateur rocketry. I have no knowledge of anybody ever coming close to this one. Um, it uses a full-blown liquid propulsion system. We have the tanks here which is almost the the 80% of the length of the vehicle, that's just propellant tanks. They contain about 1.2 tons of rock propellant. And then in the back end, we have the rocket engine. It resides in here. We cannot see much of it, but it's inside this riveted structure. And it releases a, a thermal energy uh, comparable to a small power station in the order of 150,000 horsepower. And that consumes the propellant in here in just 90 seconds. One and a half minute after ignition, the fuel tanks are empty. But at that time, this baby is flying 3.5 times the speed of sound and traveling at about 60 kilometers altitude. And when you're going that fast at that high altitude, you don't stop on a dime. So, so potentially this rocket can reach about 100 kilometers altitude. At the top of it, we have a uh, a section lying over here with containing parachutes, which allows it to be recovered, it can land on the sea. And on top of the top, we have uh, a capsule that is um, a model of our future manned spacecraft. So it's a, it's a tiny uh, model of it that is used to test the re-entry mechanics. Is it going to melt during re-entry? We're having very high temperatures and so on. So we have to test parachutes and we have to test uh, the heat shield and, and, and all of these things with this capsule. Because of the capsule, we're not getting as high as we would without the capsule. It weighs something like 80 kilos in order to fall with enough energy to test the heat shield. So uh, from my perspective, it would be perhaps nicer to have a second stage on this one. We would be able to launch to the altitude of the International Space Station if we had a second stage on it. Uh, but our mission goal at Copenhagen Subopsils is to produce a spacecraft where humans can go to space at a very small cost, not for commercial purposes, but because we think it would be wonderful for ordinary people to be able to do such a thing, to build the rocket from the scratch and ultimately fly into space. To demonstrate that that's possible if you desired enough is basically our mission. Do you think this, this is a way to help the Earth 
in times of uh, fucked ecology, like Anthropocene times, or it's a, a more about like ontological movement, people just are going, uh, taking possibilities to go away from the earth. How, how do, you f do you feel this? Mm -hmm. I think the best thing that one can say about what we do here is that it's a demonstration that ordinary people can do a lot more than they might think they can. Uh, traditionally, spaceflight has been the, the regime of governments. It's the United States, it's uh, Russia, it's China that has done this sort of thing before. Actually, those are the three nations on the planet that, had ever, that has ever launched a human into space. Now, what if some people from a small Scandinavian country, without any government backing at all, managed to do the same thing? Now, that would be interesting. That would be funny. And it's possible because we live in a world today where communication has been so much easier. We can obtain contact to people with different skills very easily using the internet. It's quite incredible what can be done if you really desire it. And one important thing to remember is that you don't invent anything new by, by doing what people are telling you. Because they will tell you to give up. So you want to go to space. It's impossible. You can't do that. You have no government. You have no money. You've got nothing. Now, if you listen to that sort of speak, you go nowhere. If instead you listen to your dreams and say, what does it take to do that? What does it really, really take? What did it take back in the 19 long ago? Well, it took some aluminium and some skilled workers, and it took some engineering and some math and so on, and you put that together. You can leave the planet for other planets. You can do just about anything if you decide enough. And that's the best thing we can give people. That is to tell them, you can do it. This is a test model, right? It's this is a, a 65 test centimeter model. caliber Heat 2X, but it's just a small one. We have a big one over here. This is only half finished, but it's the first half of what is equal to the small one. Uh, it will become a rocket capable of launching a manned spacecraft into, into space. Or if we put upper stages to it, if we put a small rocket on top of it and an even smaller on top of that, we can launch something to the moon with this size of rocket. And it's very, very cheaply built. We're talking an object with the cost of a family car, something like that. We're using a lot of ordinary things uh, to make it work. Not, none of the stuff that's here is, is very high tech and uh, basically could be built anywhere. And so that's an important step. I just wanted to show that we have the super rocket under construction here. Okay. And compare it to the smaller one. Do you think you go inside of it, Peter? Uh, definitely. But you just have to remember it's a step. Okay? It's a you don't, step. Yeah, you don't go in and you build the moon rocket day one. You build a smaller one. You refine that. You build a bigger one then. You refine that. Then you build the prototype for the biggie, for, like this one is. And you fly a couple of those before you put a man on top of it. We have some other components here that I think is funny. Look at this sphere. Uh, we made this. Uh, it's always been a, a challenge to produce a high uh, pressure, very light tank. And this is potentially the third stage for this one, allowing it to become a moon rocket. Um, this is potentially, and that means this is a prototype again, like this is a prototype. Everything you see here is not the ultimate. It's always something that's going to be something that's going to be something that's going to be the real thing. Okay, but this is just a test experiment. But the funny thing is we made a sphere tank using um, a high pressure water washing machine that is used to, to buckle these sub elements so that they are round. And then we, we weld them and that makes up a complete sphere. And this is a very, very light tank, a very, very strong tank used for propellants for the third stage. And it's been a, a, a challenge for me for many years to be able to make spheres from flat plates. You know, originally this was just flat plates like the ones lying over there. And this option, uh, this political option of you to, um, you guys, to put everything in open source, um, 
put all the information about your process on the internet, uh, from where it came from, uh, when, when it, it started oh, to be a political uh, yeah, action? Yeah, it's a wonderful question. Uh, why do we do everything open source and how do we organize this? Well, the, the wonderful thing is that, or the, should I say the terrible thing is, if you are von Braun, you work in a military program or in a government finance program or even in a program with, with the private finances. And in such programs, everything is secret. Don't want the other competitive companies to know how they deal with things, how they solve their problems. They keep things quite secret and very much within you know, corporate space. So if we were professionals, we would be put under this situation. We wouldn't be allowed to tell why we do it, how we do it, or any other thing. You know, we, it would be all secret. Uh, the wonderful thing about being amateurs and independent and open source is that we can tell everybody about how we work and why we do it and what we're thinking about when we do it. Um, so we do that. We make videos, we make, uh, uh, we make lots of things, we make uh, the blog. Every, every week I write two or three stories on The Engineer, uh, a Danish magazine where I share all that I think about and Christian does the same thing on Wired magazine. But the fact is that this produces a community of supporters around us. This has produced such a community so that more than a thousand people are supporting Copenhagen's portals with finances. They're just giving uh, like $25 a month. But because there's a thousand pe people doing that, it adds up to $25,000 a month. And that's enough to pay the house rent and pay the materials and, and everything that we spent. Um, and that's very important. And I love to work in this environment where there is no private investor who tells us how to do things or to get finished or anything like that. We can really work with the technology and have a very, very nice environment to operate in uh, because of this condition of non-commercial. Uh, and um, so many people from free software or open source movement, do it yourself, young people, I don't know, from the universities, they, yeah. they look looking have, for you. Uh, yeah, and it's, it's a problem because <laughs> I have no way of absorbing the amount of talents that are offering their services for, for suboxals. We, we could not have the 75 interns that would like to be here speaking 75 different languages. Um, so we try to, certainly in my department, Christian only has five or six people working with him, uh, and he needs people with very high skill level, and, and they're very, very committed. Of course, he uses more than five, six people, but it's the, the core people working with the spacecraft. It's a very small group. In the booster department and for the ships and so on, I can absorb quite a larger amount of people. So I don't know how many we are there, 25 or something. Totally, we are 55 people working in Subortals, and, and we share a lot of group of a lot of the group. Christian uses the same electronics people as I do, and so forth. Um, but it's not possible for us to absorb the number of people who write us every month that they would like to join. So I have to very carefully select people and put them into the organization in such a way that they will not scare away the people already there. And the, the problem is that you come into an 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 organization that already has a lot of good people. And you have to take part, not just in the technical things, but in the human things. You have to come become friendly. You have to become a friend with the others. We are a group of comrades. Um, and, and you have to penetrate this, this atom and become one of the particles that makes up the atom without breaking it apart, which is really the, the best way of describing it. What's interesting is that we can see that when people get in, when they, when they join the atom, when they join this, this suborbitals atom, they stick. Uh, we don't lose anybody. People who have gotten into the project stick to the project. We actually have, we have lost like three persons over eight years, over five years, and uh, that has always been that they either move to another country, well that's the only way we've lost anybody people have moved to other countries. Um, if they stay in this country, they will remain active and they will work with the program. Okay, that's, 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 that's quite incredible that it happens. Yeah. It grows, and when it grows, it becomes more interesting to join. And because it's getting more interesting to join, people join. But because they join, it gets larger. And that means you've got more stuff happening, and that means more people will join. And 
there's actually no stopping this except the size of the planet. Imagine that. Maybe someday we're going to be 100 people or 200 people working here and thousands of people supporting it worldwide. That is possible. We could become a, an amateur space program that would, on a regular basis, put people into space or, doing, or do other fantastic experiments. I still dream of building or rebuilding a, a Zeppelin or a, a rigid airship or something. There are so many crazy things that you could do with that sort of an organization.